Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to the Emmett Blackwell Show. I want to thank you all for listening, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. On this episode, I will be speaking with author Diane Astle about her Six Worlds series. We discuss her books, her path to becoming an author, and what she has next on the horizon for her writing. So, without any further ado, let's begin. Moses and the Dragonborn, Book 3 of the Six Worlds series by Diane Estel. To save his world, the Dragonborn King captured a demon and took it to the world of Farn, but the king never returned. Six are chosen to rescue the king from the blighted world, including a former brownie slave named Moses, who has no reason to love him. Moses goes with the words, Let my people go, singing in his heart. Can the six chosen ones overcome their differences and a half-crazy watcher's reluctance to help them? Find out by joining Ben and his companions on a quest that will change each one of them and the world of Farn in this new adventure of the Dragonborn. Get your copy of Moses and the Dragonborn, book three of the Six Worlds series by Diane Astle at Amazon.com. All right, and I am here with author Diane Astle. And Diane, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thank you. So how now, are you? I'm doing fantastic. Now, um, when did you decide to actually write fantasy? Well, it wasn't really a conscious decision. I had been working too many 60-hour weeks and decided I needed a break. So I went to a retreat center and the only thing that didn't feel like more work was a course on writing fiction. So I took it thinking it would be easy, but it wasn't easy. It was a lot of work. And then on the way home, I had this idea for Ben the Dragonborn. So now I'm not only working lots of uh, hours in a week, but I'm also writing fiction. Yeah, but you know, what kind of work is that really? You know, when you think about it, when you get to expand yourself, it's like you're on constant vacation, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. You get to go to different worlds. Now, yes. <laughs> now, many of your books revolve around dragons. Why do you think you have such a love for these mythical creatures? Well, I've always been attracted to dragons. For example, I have a dragon teapot that doesn't really pour very well, but I keep it because it's a dragon. And of course, dragon necklace and the only stuffy I've ever bought myself is a dragon. <laughs> and uh, so I've always been fascinated by dragons. And several years ago, I needed to talk to a psychologist. I'd worked too much and too hard and burnt out. And, and so I talked to a psychologist and she asked me, what kind of animal I would be if I could be any animal. And I think she was expecting, oh, a kitten or, you know, something like that. But I said dragon and this look of shock on her face. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's perfect. You can breathe fire, and then if it gets really bad, you can just fly away. <laughs> and we all wish we could do that. Now, in your Six World series, okay, you bring a new concept to fantasy that almost verges on science fiction. What inspired this idea? I don't really know what it's inspired it. I just wrote the first book, and I hadn't really intended to write any more books. But people started saying, okay, when's the second book coming? And uh, I realized that people enjoyed the world I'd built and uh, that uh, I would go on and write the, a second book and then a third book. And I've got plans at some point to write the fourth. Wow, that's incredible. Now, now your first book, Ben the Dragonborn. Ben is thrust into a very unfamiliar world. What types of creatures does he encounter? Well, the first creature he encounters is a, a mermaid 
who he finds to be incredibly annoying, even though she's he's saved his life. And with her is a, a, a fish-type creature. I guess it would be more like a mammal, sort of like, uh, well, maybe a whale, orca, whatever, who uh, looks sort of like an orcas but has bigger teeth. And uh, he gets a ride on the back of this creature to the school on the world that's very much uh, like uh, the school on Earth. And he gets a ride there, and he's given the choice of either helping that world or going back to Earth. And it's a water f- world full of water. And he was, uh, Lushaka, he was so... Um, terrified of being in water that was deep that he didn't really want to stay but in the end he does then in, on, as he goes on the journey there's these big birds whose behavior has recently changed and they used to pick up animals to eat and maybe small children but now they're picking up uh, things as well like the Mer King's crown and there's giant spiders and uh, there's actually, I think, the in- most interesting character are the spider crabs who live under the sand, but if something walks across the sand, they all come up and and converge and eat, and they eat one another, and mm-hmm. the world is very cannibalistic, actually. And then there's the uglies, which are huge dinosaur-type creatures who uh, chase them. And uh, so... it. In this uh, this world, you have the mermaids who can transform from mermaid to human and back again. And uh, Ben is about to discover that he can transform into a dragon and back again. And he can do this because his mother was from the world of Zargon. Wow. Now, do you find it interesting to actually kind of dive into the uh, like the biology, the creating of the biology of all these different creatures? Yeah, yeah. It's a little challenging because I don't want to have something that's exactly like somebody else has in their book, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, your second book of the series, Ben and the Watcher of Zargon, tell us a little bit about that book. So, Ben is having trouble with the dragon side of his heritage. He can't, uh, he's transformed once in the first book, but when he goes back to Earth, to the watcher at his school, asks him not to transform. So he doesn't, but he's discovering that he's starting to get uh, scales that are appearing on his back and on his arms, and he comes to realize that he's got to transform, and he really does, because if he doesn't, he's going to end up being neither human or dragon, and he'll end up being sort of a lizard creature that, uh, actually in the third book, he's going to meet a lizard creature that wasn't able to make that transformation. And so it's very important that he learn to do that. So he has to go then to um, the world of uh, Zargon, and his mother is missing somewhere, so he goes to Zargon to find his grandfather. And... Uh, he doesn't, like, the Watcher doesn't want to send him right away because there's something going wrong on Zargon, and she can't connect to the Watcher there. And uh, so, finally, the decision is made that if she doesn't send him, he's going to die trying to transform because it's uh, become very dangerous for him. And uh, he feels this burning in his stomach, and he's, he's just got to let it go. He's got to transform and be a dragon. Wow. Now, in the third book, Moses and the Dragonborn, um, this kind of deals with the combined forces of six companions. What obstacles do they face? They go to Farn on the surface to rescue the king of Zargon, who captured a demon that was creating problems on his world in the uh, second book. And he took him to Farn. And so he's gone missing on that world. So these six companions are sent there to rescue the king. But with all of my book, there's the presenting conflict. But there's a much bigger issue that needs to be resolved. And so the issue on this world is that the world has been devastated by a war to end all wars. The creatures that still exist have mutated. And uh, the human-like creatures that haven't mutated are living underground. 
And so um, six of them go, three from Zargon and three from Earth. And uh, Ben is uh, uncomfortable going with one of the Earth people he's going with named Allison. And early in the book, he tries to kiss her, and that does not go well. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Allison maybe needs a little bit more depth. She is a little too perfect and is always right about almost everything. And uh, he goes with his best friend and roommate, who has had a habit of getting Ben into trouble. And uh, Denzel is African-American and has experienced some racism, which racism is a bit of a theme in that book. But, uh, you know, the, the flop-eared cat creature is opposed to the perky ear cat creatures. So it's uh, a bit of a theme in that book. And then there's, um, so those are the three from Earth. And then there's th three from Zargon. And uh, Zinc is the son of the king of Zargon. And, you know, he, he expects to privilege and to be given the best positions because he is the king's son. Uh, he's a bit of a surprise when he's chosen to be one of the Guardian's uh, chosen people uh, because he'd colluded with his father's enemy, the father's enemy who was trying to steal the throne for himself. Uh, he's a little arrogant and uh, difficult. And um, yeah, Zoe, the other person from Zargon who goes with him, hates Zinc. Her family suffered because of the man Zinc colluded with. And uh, so, you know, they don't really get along, and Zinc doesn't really get along with Ben. Ben is actually his nephew, even though they're the same age. Uh, Zinc is Ben's grandfather's son for, by his second wife. And uh, so, you know, they don't really get along. And so they've got to learn to get along. The only thing that Zoe and Zinc agree with is that Moses shouldn't be there. Now, Moses is a brownie. So he's a fur-covered creature, and his people uh, are basically slaves on Zargon. And uh, he's given the most coveted gifts by the Guardian. Like, he is made the uh, group's wizard and given wizarding gifts, which are highly coveted. And, of course, Zinc thinks they should have been given to him as the king's son. And uh, he uses some of his gifts to go to Sarg Zargon, where he liberates some of the brownies from their slavery and brings them to the world of Farn to help people that world. Like the world is basically empty in so many places. So they are becoming new people on that world. The new people of that world. A world of their own. Yeah, that's interesting. And you know, one thing too, Diane, it seems to me like, like from book one to book three here, you've got quite a bit of progression. Okay. And, and it, by the time you hit book three, there's a lot of complicated themes. There's a lot of things that, that children of older ages would, would begin to be exposed to and understand. Did you kind of have that in mind when you were writing the second and third book? What happened was, um, You've got to know that I suffered learning disabilities when I was in school and failed out of everything you could fail of, out of, uh, and ended up graduating by taking hairdressing. So I went back to school as an adult and took history and English and managed to get into university as a mature student. Um, and then I now have a master's degree, but in spite of that, my writing level wasn't that incredibly good for the first book. I'd never taken a writing course, uh, never read a book about writing fiction, and uh, had never been part of a critique group. I didn't hire an editor for that book. And so what you're seeing in the second book is that I, ha I became part of a writer's critique group, and I also hired a content editor. And these people basically became my education on how to be a writer. So th the first book really is pretty simple, and my writing gets more complicated as you go along. The interesting thing was I, 
uh, self-published Ben the Dragonborn after getting really good rejection letters from publishers. And I think if I wanted to, I could probably find a publisher now. Uh, but I'd only want a really major publisher because I think I do better self-published otherwise. Mm -hmm. So actually, you know, it's, it's kind of strange to me because I've seen this a lot in writers, in actors, in musicians who grow up with learning disabilities and the worlds that they can create in their minds. They might not be able to put it all on paper right now, but the worlds that they create within their mind, the music they create, everything that they can create is incredible. And once you get that, that, that learning experience and you get them down the right path, they do amazing things. And you, Diane, are a perfect example of this. You have created amazing worlds and amazing creatures. And now, did you always have that kind of ability in your own mind when you were younger to kind of put together these things without even having to put them on paper? Well, one of my problems when I was in school wasn't just my learning disabilities, but it was I was also a dreamer. Mm. So the teacher would be talking and I'd understand what they were saying. And then I would slip away to my dream world. And by the time I came back, I had no idea what they were talking about. And so that was part of the problem. I think, is that I did live in a dream world when I was younger. But that said, I love to be a dreamer, and I love to be someone who imagines possibilities Wow, and, and it, alternative realities. <laughs> and, you know, in your third book, I mean, really, with all the themes that you deal with, okay, with the racism things and, and with the wars and, and things like that, these are like real-life scenarios that happen every day. And the fact that, I mean, and this is one thing I've said about science fiction and about fantasy, is if you can take a story and relate it to reality, then that's a good story. Okay. And I think you've done an excellent job in doing that because your, your characters are relatable. The story is relatable. The world is relatable. Even though this came out of uh, your fantastical mind, it's still something that, that people can walk away from this book and learn something. You know, like you said, there, there's, there's crack cat creatures that have pointy ears or floppy ears. You know, who's to say that, that we can't look around in the world after reading one of your books and say, you know what? We do need to work together. The only way that we can survive, the only way that we can continue on is to work together. And, I mean, honestly, Diane, that, that that's an excellent way to, to get any kind of message out, even if it's through fiction. So I commend you for that immensely. Well, I think good fantasy, and I'd like to think I have some good fantasy here, but I don't know, maybe. But anyway, I think it helps to teach us how to live in the real world. You know, particularly epic fantasy that deals with, uh, you know, the hero's quest and, you know, uh, taking on a quest for the good of others. It's not all about you, you know. Mm -hmm. And I find sometimes in my books, I'll see a news story and I won't know, like I sort of write by the seat of my pants. <laughs> I don't come out and draw a diagram as to where I'm going. But I'll see a news story and I'll go, hey, yeah, that's a good idea. That's the direction I need to go. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and that's a good way to start, you know. Now, you've also written nonfiction. And how does that differ between the fiction that you're writing now? How is it similar? Uh, well, I think in both the fiction and the nonfiction, like when I was writing Ben the Dragonborn, I was just trying to tell a good story that people would enjoy reading. I didn't think in terms of a deeper meaning in it. But after I wrote it and I was looking at it, I realized that the theme that has guided my life was present in my fiction book. And the theme that has sort of become important to me, uh, well, you know, in the last several years, uh, I struggled earlier in life with uh, uh drugs and alcohol and low self-esteem and, uh, you know, really uh, it was uh, very challenging. I didn't believe I had any gift or any value at all. And so it was really quite challenging for me. But the theme that has sort of been a part of my life is uh, uh, seek the treasure of your own true self. And that shows up as a theme in Ben the Dragonborn, in that Ben has to seek the treasure of his own true self if he's going to be able to bless the world that he finds himself in. And I think that's true for us all, that we have to 
seek the treasure of our own true self and be who we really are if we're going to be a blessing in the world and we're going to enrich other people's lives and make the world a better place by having lived in it. Wow. And I think you're on the right path to doing that. So now what do you have planned next for your writing? Well, I'm just finishing a time-traveling historical romance that I'm going to publish under the name probably of Eliza Broughton. And uh, it's go- possibly be- going to be called The Sims Family Connection. And uh, its uh, I've really been enjoying writing it, actually. I've been enjoying researching history, and I sit there with a genealogy on my uh, beside my computer and then search for things like, uh, oh, did they use a horse-drawn um, thrashing machine, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, did they use iron stoves in uh, 1835? And, and I've researched then the Revolutionary War and uh, uh, the abolitionist movement and the founding of the state of Tennessee and Indiana and the laws around slavery in uh, uh, Virginia. M- my ancestor left Virginia because, I think, because he couldn't free his slaves when he became a member of the Primitive Methodist Church. And basically, I'm wanting to tell his story, but I'm not doing it straight up. I'm doing it through a character I've created who coincidentally has the same ancestor as I do. Whether anyone will want to read that, I don't know, but that's what I'm doing. And then probably starting in February, as soon as I get this one done, I'm going to begin the fourth Ben the Dragon book and go to another world. And in this world... Uh, I think it's going to be a world that's really advanced technologically, but the world has been taken over by a watcher that's become corrupt. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they need to uh, remove what is keeping him alive for an unnaturally long time. Wow, that, that that sounds incredible. And actually, the contrast of having this overly technological world to what you had before, I mean, that would be, that'd be really incredible. It'll be challenging for me because I don't really have the most technological mind. But, you know, a challenge is always good, right? Yeah, exactly. Now, you are an amazing author, an amazing woman, and even a better daydreamer than I've ever seen anybody um, because you've created all these amazing worlds. Okay. Now, what advice would you give a new author who is just starting out? I would uh, advise the new authors just starting out to find a critique group and uh, join it. I have a a fabulous critique group in uh, Vancouver, B.C., and uh, I drive two hours to get to them, but they're all uh, science fiction, fantasy, maybe murder mystery authors, and uh, maybe literary fiction, horror authors, whatever strikes your fancy, and they have been so helpful. And the other thing I have is a content editor, Alex McGilvery, who's also an author, is an excellent uh, content editor, and I very much have appreciated his work for the last two books. When I first published my first book, I ordered 60 copies, and they were sold like hotcakes, and... uh, Anyway, I was so proud of them, but then somebody came up to me and said, Diane, do you realize there's a lot of mistakes in this book? And I thought, well, I have a master's degree. I don't, you know, I should be able to, my my writing skills are good now. Well, they weren't (laughs) that great. (laughs) It is, it is always nice to have somebody look over your work. I mean, it really is. Um, and, and it's incredible advice that you've given, uh, the worlds that you've created. Like I've said before, you're an amazing woman. You're an amazing author. You're an amazing dreamer. And I, I really want to thank you for being on this show just because it's incredible to have somebody like you who has overcome her own obstacles to get to where you're at. And it is really an inspiration to a lot of people. I'm sure all those kids that are re- reading the Dragonborn series, Ben the Dragonborn, are, are just 
ecstatic about waiting for this next book to come out. And, um, and the adults are, are ready to, to see something different from you. And so I, I want to see some more writing from you, even if you are under another pen name. So I'll be keeping my eye on you and, and, uh, hopefully we'll have you on the show again. All right. Now we've hit the part of the show where we actually invite you to participate in a trivia game. So would you like to participate in a trivia game? With fear and trembling. <laughs> okay, so here's the game. This is a trivia game about fantasy villains. Are you ready? I am. All right. Each question, if you get it right, will be worth 1,000 points. Wow. <laughs> yeah. They're, well, they're not really used for anything, and you can't really exchange them for anything, so they're really kind of like worthless points, but that's okay because you can get 1,000 of them per question. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. 1,000 a thousand points works for me. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here's the first question. Who was Harry Potter's enemy? Voldemort. Yes, correct. Here's the next question. Who was Alice's antagonist in Alice in Wonderland? Oh, the queen, the queen of hearts. Yes, correct. Very good. Here's the next one. Who was the pirate who fought against Captain Jack Sparrow in Pirates of the Caribbean, The Black Pearl? Uh, I'm not... I've seen that movie, but the, the name has escaped me. All right. The actual answer to that was Captain Barbosa. Oh, I w wouldn't have remembered it, I'm sure. <laughs> That's fine. All right, next question. What was the name of Peter Pan's arch nemesis? Mm, the guy with a peg leg, Captain Hook. Yes, Captain Hook, correct. Next question. What was the name of Sherlock Holmes' worst enemy? He was also known by Sherlock Holmes as the Napoleon of crime. Ooh, I've watched that recently, and I'm... Uh, you know, it's not... Uh, it's not coming to me. Okay. I know it, but it's not coming to me. Okay, it was Professor Moriarty. Moriarty, of course, yes. <laughs> yes. That's okay, because you can redeem yourself. Don't worry, don't worry. All right, here we go. The next question. In the land of Narnia, who is the evilest in the land? Oh, the witch. The Yeah, the does she call herself the White Witch? Yes, correct, the White Witch. All right, so here's here's one that's a little bit challenging. This one is, is difficult because it kind of goes a little bit out of the world of fantasy into the world of horror with my favorite author, Stephen King. All right? Now, in Stephen King's The Stand, what name did Lucifer take? It's the name of a man. I have no idea. All right, it was Randall Flagg. I would have, wouldn't have known that one. The <laughs> other two that I missed, I actually knew, but that one I didn't know. <laughs> All right, here's the next one. This one should be easy breezy. All right, here we go. In 101 Dalmatians, who attempts to capture the puppies to turn them into fur coats? Corella de Ville. Yes, correct. Here's the next one. This one's a little bit challenging. In The Lord of the Rings... What was the name of the master sorcerer who forged the One Ring? Ah, uh, I want to say Sauron, but I yes, don't it is. think that's right. Is it? Yes, okay. it is. Sauron, yes. Very, very good. I, I said Saruman, and that was the, the wizard, and I messed that up really bad. But anyhow, you did a very good job. And here we go with a bonus question. Now, this question could redeem all the questions that you got wrong, and you could walk away with this. With get this, get this, two trillion points. Two trillion points. Wow. Yeah. Now, this this would wipe the slate clean. You'd you'd walk away a winner, and you'd have two trillion points to do whatever you want with because they're not redeemable anywhere. So, <laughs> here we go. They're they're redeemable in my imagination. Oh yeah, and we know how good your imagination is. These things are going to be showing up on on Zorgon and we're <laughs> going to be using them for a currency or something. So, here we go. <laughs> All right. In the Wizard of Oz, who was after Dorothy's ruby red slippers? The Wicked Witch of the West. Yes, correct. And you won the game with two trillion points. Congratulations. 
Um, Diane, it has been a wonderful experience having you on the show. You are an incredible person. Um, I love your writing, and I'm sure your fans do too. Where can people find your books? Uh, as an ebook, it's available uh, everywhere at the moment, like uh, iBooks, Kobo, Barnes and Noble, and Kindle. And as a print book, at the moment, it's only available through Amazon. But uh, the platform that I'm using is planning to go into print books, and uh, so I'm pl- hoping to have them print the book as well. I have a feeling that other non-Amazon sites will be more uh, keen to carry it when it's published by someone else other than Amazon. Wow. Well, congratulations on that. I look forward to seeing all the new writing that you have coming out either underneath this name or or your pen name. What was the other pen name that you were going to use? Eliza Broughton. I just want to say thank you very much for hosting me on the show. It was a privilege to be here and spend some time with you and your listeners. Thank you so much. Anyhow, this is Emmett Blackwell signing out. Keep on reading and keep on writing, my friends. Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. 